Is absence a new moment? Does it have its own sort of presence? So Norman Fisher asks in the epigraph of, Amy, of Lainey Brown's practice. In a human era, at least here in the States, in which two of the greatest transformations of our lives, birth and death, have been largely remo been removed or rendered absent from our households and from the intimately witnessed, displaced as they often are, into hospitals and systems. Poetry, as Robin Blazer once said, is and remains that one art form dedicated to the knowledge of death and to acknowledging and testifying, this isn't Robin Blazer, <laughs> and to acknowledging and testifying to the permeability of the living and to our separa unitedness. Which is to say, welcome <laughs> to what is only our second in-person poetry reading in almost three years. Before, but also as a way of reflecting on our two tremendous readers tonight, I just want to take a brief moment to think about this transition we're making back from the virtual, a juncture in our history and artistic practice, which the work of this evening's poets helped me to, be, to remain awake to. In thinking about the movement from Zoom to this room, uh, it's occurred to me, and you're gonna have to work with me here because it was hard to express, um, that we're experience, what we're experiencing isn't simply the restoration of presence in which the speaker and listener, the sensible and the censor are returned to the same intimate space, but also the restoration of absence, the presence of absence or what Merleau-Ponty calls the reunion with our original strangeness, which an embodied poetry reading in its supreme form, and we are in the presence of two supreme poets tonight in Acts, in which the body and voice of the poet aren't simply the positing of a contents, but the opening of a dimension. Yes, it was great to have Alice Notley and Sonia Sanchez and Cecilia Vicuña in my living room via Zoom, but what was not in my living room was the body and that awesome encounter with just how near to us beyondness is. Whereas tonight, within five feet of us, sharing breath with us, two humans in this room will be moving between the fire and the great fire, to quote Victoria Chang. Here, yes, in person, yes, but also in communication with, resonating with, that portion of the impersonal, that small ever, to quote Clarice Lispector, that's within us all. An in-person poetry reading reawakens us to the fact that there is no being only here. Or to quote Rosemary Waldrop, existence isn't in the narrower sense. And who better to help us experience the humility and immensity of this than our two readers tonight, Lainey Brown and Victoria Chang. Their intensive and extensive work, as Creeley once said of Dickinson, the epic minimalism of it, the temporality and eternity of it, the nexus of presence and absence within and without it, the orphaned and orphic power and poignancy of it, written as, at once as daughters and mothers, as the created and creators, and the radical inclusivity of their forms and formations, in which, as Laney writes in her daily sonnets, any one or thing can speak, the dead, the imagined, the dictionary. When time is unhinged, she said, all are welcome. Or to quote Victoria Chang speaking of dear memory, the epistolary form was a way for me to speak to the dead, the not yet dead, the sky, the wild turkey, a younger self away from myself toward my dead mother, toward my history, toward my father's silence, toward the silence. 
That's what obit means, literally, at its etymological root, to head toward. The forms they adopt on this journey, be they list poems or tankas, are not forces of nostalgia or containment or even preservation. Both adopt known forms, not as modes of stasis, but to structure radical transitions and burst the very boundaries of their person. You may well have a better metaphor than this to share with me afterwards, but for, I for one felt at times reading their work like I was in a rocket suddenly shorn of its booster, piercing space, subject to dispersal, and ready, as my favorite headstone says, to be anything. So get ready and join me in welcoming Lainey Brown and Victoria Chang, who will read in that order. Thank you so much, Christina. That was such a beautiful introduction. I'm so grateful and honored to be here and to be reading with Victoria. And thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm going to read in a few parts tonight. I wanted to dedicate this reading to my father, Alan Brown, who passed on September 8th. I'm going to be reading from this uh, recent book, Translation of the Lilies Back into Lists. Um, but first, I'm going to read a little bit of really new, really raw, untested work. Um, two tiny prose poems from a manuscript I started in the summer that's called Names Before They Were Maidens. And then um, a dialogue I started writing with my father every day since his passing, which is tentatively titled A Lava Step at Any Time. And I think that's all I need to say. Stillness. Why not try locate? After meeting with the dead, finding myself in many locations at once is my most prominent dream sign. Still, I doubt. A flicker in this exact set of circumstances precisely for the purpose of bodiless practice. How many days has it taken to realize that imposed stillness is a reminder of contemplation, another vector of which we are composed, the one that allows access to realms beyond three dimensions, pink vibrational waves, spider galaxies, oceans of roses. Occasions. I took care of all of the occasions in my hand. This was before flipping pages encountered in eyes, turning weather instruments inside books. Butterflies blinked. Cameos remained in blue profile. Silence clustered near the edge of any necessary eclipse. The occasions were all illusory, also organic, based on lunar calendars and hidden orders, mostly unfollowed, though unknown to stumps, birds, and plants. You could say I was motionless, though this would be inaccurate. I emerged slowly from underneath the filtered light of a crown beginning to open sitting with missives and persons takes a long time, but this makes perfect sentience since occasions are made of persons as well as nonverbal sources. And thus begins the dialogue. So there's two voices, which it's easy to lose track of and I think that's okay. I don't, I'm still working with it. It's really new. So I'll just read a few of these. And the dialogue with you is called? Finally, you allow yourself to cry. I've been busy flying across conundrums. 
we wouldn't use that word. Managing everyone's inner disaster? Like it's not my father dying? Careful with your tenses? It won't hurt my feelings if you write that I'm dead. Why should I? I don't know, fluidity? Starting to catch myself in the act of? Almost avoiding. Loyalty to each and every, wanna play ping pong? Now? When else, I bet I'd still beat you, dead. I'm sure you would. I recognize that attitude and it's been so long. You have no idea how glad I am to be out. You stopped resembling the second you stopped breathing. I haven't looked. The way you wrote honestly just now in my notebook looks like your handwriting. It is my handwriting. And everything that seems so urgent, give it to the wind. Don't forget that hand gesture with the saying, like this. Also, you could try saying next while snapping. And these are tactics for dismissing a reaction to something or someone that might be diminishing, meaning don't exactly. I caught myself reading your copy of an underlined dog-eared thought form when I couldn't sleep. And you told yourself not sleeping, nothing was a problem. Because there are no problems. That's what that book says. And then the power flickered out and back three times. Restored at 1.56 a.m. according to an ancestral cell as in body or device, there is no or. And I realized I was keeping myself stuck. My death is waking you up. I don't have time to annoy every tear. My death is fantastic. Too much enthusiasm, though I do feel a little bit stranded in the material world. Make the upgrade to 5D. Do it now, and you'll downshift less often. I am trying, and the world is so alluring. Try this. Give it to the wind. Help me to stop strengthening the fiction of me. But first, to speak with you, I must locate you. Not true. In myself, no need. You're everywhere, I'm everywhere. These separations aren't. I'm crying into my coffee and looking at your photograph propped up against a vase of roses. Why? Stop it. What? I'm joking, but not really. Meaning you won't allow this for long? I'm not in charge. What do you want right now? Nothing. Well, that's not exactly true. I wish I had a smartphone or a map or some instructions. Where are you? Are you really going to keep asking that? You aren't lost, are you? You've read too many books about the bardo. So you're lost. You know, I didn't ever believe in what happens next. And now, this has nothing to do with belief. Tell me your, tell me you've, tell me you'll. Was that you, a little spot of light appearing to my right and above, floating? You were reading in bed, my underlined copy. The light, bright spot, white and tiny, one or two revolving circles for an instant in the periphery, or was I trying to see you? But unconsciously, all the time, I'm hoping to sense what? Nothing visual, but sometimes auditory or small steps, scent, 
mostly knowing when I speak to you or walk into an empty space here. The light was visual. If I saw it, could it have been a bright flash of what? I wasn't holding anything but a book. Are you saying books aren't reflective, aren't shining, don't generate emanations? That bright light I thought was you to my right just now was the sun rising. So brief introduction to this book. Um, I started out with the idea of translating my daily to-do lists into poems so that the poems are, don't contain the tasks, but rather the thoughts around the tasks. So every poem is a list, and every poem is titled with a date. And the poems begin in December of 2015 and go through May of 2016. Um, the title is inspired by C.D. Wright's wonderful book, Translation of the Gospel Back into Tongues. And there are some collages in the book. And um, they're in black and white, but I want to show you the color versions. Um, and I'll just, there's just six of them, and there's a line associated with each one in the book. So I'll show those, and then I'll read. And then the room became a person I knew in many bodies. If the heroine does not descend to the underworld, does she retreat inside a child? Discard those formerly fallen, crystallized selves. I change the color of my ink each time I died. Words have their own minds. I think I skipped one. Let's see. What was it exactly we could not resist? Thanks. December 31st, 2015, two. The daily takes too much time. Therefore, I propose to waking every second, beginning each moment. The new year is just an excuse for counting. Numbers don't keep anyone safe. Ideas lurk in symbols and murders occur in figures. The squirrel runs up a tree, but we do not accuse him of squirrelishness or thievery or absent-mindedness. Where is substance buried? Shall I reply again to your drawings? I'm leaving habit on a high shelf, going for a walk in sound. January 5th, 2016. Misplacing the year is useful. Pretext may grow into medicine. Ignore numbers until they become secret persons. Pour out this metal thermos. But it isn't a thermos. That's just an image to help you physicalize an intellectual process. If you want to transform a book, you'll need ingredients. Read lines from an enchantress when you want to be a bird. Ingest 
liquid prose when you prefer to be fluid. A good title only proves you have work ahead of you. Remembering your potency impels me further. I want to be impaled by a poem. Beginning is always precarious. Avoid snow-covered terrain and long-haired ponies. Avoid skipping ahead as I've inadvertently just done. Return to certain constitutional texts when you need protection. Refuse to look at detailed maps. You don't need to know the future. Your headache isn't fake, but pretend if you can. Fantasize that for the next six hours, you will not stop. All pain will end almost immediately if you are able to endure forgetfulness. Welcome imperfection as you would a cup of tea served to you by a beautiful, devoted attendant. Your attendant will stay as long as you like. When lost, reread these instructions. Don't speak. Ecstatic impulse is now continuously you. January 11, 2016. My morning is not to be bisected. Only light may visit or persons made of words. <clears throat> How to be less obedient. I draw the line at time. Sort, carry, submerge, spin, remove, still traveling away from a moment. She was suddenly only one person when the frame split. But I remembered both hemispheres, draped thought along backs of chairs to dry, is it better to walk along an unfamiliar road in the dark? Poor ego, missing space travel through vicarious songs. When one person requires words and another silence, yet both are linked to the same impulse. Some practices are questionable and some should be questioned. To arrive, you must be willing to actively follow the barely discernible. This isn't the same practice it used to be. Not questioning where you are going, but simply going. The value of unknowns is unknown. Bestowing the highest value to the least likely concept was one way to subvert the hierarchy between sleeping and waking when lists become pantomimes, something forgotten or something difficult. His comments, though explaining failings, were comforting, mostly because process kept me company. Trust this sentence, but don't give it an undue weight. Once spoken, I did not how to retrieve or erase. It's easier to hide what another person doesn't already inhabit. Otherwise, every time she looked at my face, she would painfully remember. I was careful not to say more. Print out the names of artists. Make friends with every name. Remember where the names live. Go and visit them. Travel to various cities and to the names of various cities. Once inside a name, move about cautiously. I'm sorry the woods borrowed you. The truth is, I don't miss you as much as I miss who I was before I missed you. Wrapped in a small paper packet is your carefully preserved intent, a narrative you painstakingly forget. Need water. <laughs> <clears throat> January 13, 2016, 2. Rewrite drawings and ignore every word. My emoji life has never been more serious. If every night 
last forever. Can we start now? I left the night alone. Each day contains meaning that can only be assessed within its own quotidian borders. Now I want to transcribe my window, stopped, sealed, quieted. Where did I put that non-divisible light? A body contributed to the birth of another body involved in her own double birth. Blown from trees, snow mist evaporates. We didn't want to be snow mist. The road blows ahead. <clears throat> January 14th, 2016, 1. If you forget to send yourself, you'll never arrive. Place the book in front of you. Inside, examine a night of blue stars dangling up from disembodied arms. Consider the way an artist employs gravity, what falls hangs, protrudes, doubled over. Do tips of fingers brush ground? Place silver leaves on eyes to commemorate crying. Gather a spoonful of snow, install a delicate array, a crystal aisle below eyes. I'll always miss you. I began this for you, but I hadn't yet told you. I'm telling you now, but you can't hear me. Of course you can hear me, but the place you exist cannot be gathered in spoonfuls of snow. In one of your letters, you enunciate who I am in my wildest dreams. I remember reading and rereading this letter when it arrived, but my memory pales in comparison to your words. I still use present tense because I must. In public, your writing is a gift. In private, I also guard and brood over your advice, remembering a primal sharpness I had not yet met. You introduced me to my mother, instructed me to spend spring break in the stacks, reading her work. You set me up with my own best friend. A librarian showed me a photograph of the last quarter century. The same crescent fits into hovering. January 14th, 2016, 2. In considering the form of the list, doing is surrounded by thought. Well, I began with the notion of translating to-do lists into oblique commentary, I now see dissolved momentary movements. Tasks which destroy one's substance may be those requiring magnification. Scale means nothing in this respect. A few words placed carefully into a shell, or respectfully on a shelf, or deliberately inserted into blankness can be more costly than a great volume, the contents of an entire bookshelf, an enormous edifice of tears. Your voluminous collection is currently being housed in a small bird flying without direction. And if the bird should fail, these images are designed to continue as you close your eyes or begin plummeting. What is peril to a bird? First, recline in ink and paper, a series of concentric ribbons, revelation. Quilt a sector of arms, collaborative daughters. Walk through frozen woods, basilisk on your arm, red hoofed. The only harm you encounter is an imaginary enclosure which prevents the foretold meeting. Rapturously step out of the cavity of this breathing animal. And this last one that I'm going to read is starts with Emily Dickinson, which feels appropriate since I just got to see Emily Dickinson's desk upstairs, um, and it ends with an address to my father. February 3rd, 2016. 
furiously forget yourselves, then complete the online forms. Confirm, gingerbread meeting, talismans, and tarot with Emily Dickinson. Bring baskets, string, apron, and books. Explain how her bodiless white dress, suspended in glass, is a perfect fit. How notes are poems and also tasks. At some point, his solitary intensity turned to daggers in sloth. I walked up the paper with a neighbor discussing the need to get away. He'll say we must repave, but I prefer to endlessly stall. How different she looks when certain words emit their glow. She wore them around her neck, bound them to her thoughts, rested her face in a nest. It's all right to begin what seems distant. In fact, interrupt yourself now. My goal is to keep switching back and forth between doing and being until I disintegrate. The correct music never discusses your mood. Instead, it elevates or deflates. Form continues to morph. At first, I translated abbreviations into commentaries, opening an accordion-like discourse. But then what was already there between the pleats began demanding a say. Finally, I've noticed that by the time I arrive, parenthetical graveyards have been inserted, secret obsessions slain. Hours begin instantaneously without allowing protest or assent. It's like trying to board a bus or train at full speed. Instead, you wait. Enter when doors open, regardless of where you may be taken. If there once were signs, maps, or signals, they have since been erased. Don't stop now. The first morning jolt of doing this is like a triple espresso. If I just sit myself down before it all begins, before dressing, before fully waking, and start with dreams. He's saying goodbye through a door, and I only half hear. Could it look all right with thoughts coiled and pinned? Maybe the right pins, but these slide so nicely. Should I stop imagining the exile of pleasure? I've developed a taste for even stronger green shots of revulsion. It's like a deal I make with myself over and over again. Being invincible isn't just for mothers, but no one else knows this. Actually, the message has been sent multiple times. Should I really believe she meant to sculpt my reservations into binding backdrops? I was just standing there, minding my curtains. Too many messages, not enough mind garlands. I miss you more than you've ever repeated those words. The other night, I began stating superlatives, and you happily repeated every one. You may not remember you, me, or anyone, but I will remember us, we, and them for us all. You may not recall the meanings of words, but the tones of your voice still transmit inclinations. I wish everyone could believe the dying are still living. You are still alive. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much. That was such a lovely reading. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Because I'm, I'm going to lift this a little closer, if that's okay, but I'm gonna, I don't want to break anything. I'm, okay. So I have gotten so used to um, reading online that I just thought I'd just bring my slides, if that's okay. So you have something to look at as well. Um, but I just first wanted to thank um, the Woodbury Poetry Room for having me, Christina Davis, obviously, and Mary Graham, and it's such an honor and pleasure to read with you, Lainey, and thank you so much for coming tonight. I know um, in-person events are still, um, as you can tell, I'm, I brought books, and then I have paper, and then I have slides. I think I'm still confused, and so um, I'll be rustling up here, if that's okay. Okay. Okay.
So um, I'm going to read from th from three books, actually, and I've started to think of them as being a, a trilogy to some extent. And so I'll read a little bit from each one, and then I'll read, um, and I brought the slides because there's some collages and things that I can show you, and then I'll read just a couple new poems. And so that's kind of the map. And I'm going to start my clock so I don't do the sin. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right, although everyone, you don't know how much time I was told to read for, so we could, it could be a sin no matter what, right? <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna read a few poems from my book, Obit, and uh, I feel so much simpatico, for better or for worse, with Lainey, um, whose father just passed away, and I'm sorry for your loss. My father passed away in January. Um, my mother passed away in, in 2015, and um, she had pulmonary fibrosis, which is this lung disease where your uh, lungs gradually harden and then you suffocate to death. It's really quite awful. And so um, I wrote these little obituary poems, and I'll just read a few of them, if that's okay. And, and you get to look at them. I don't even know if you could see them, but um, at least you see the shape. I don't know how good your eyes are. Make sure I'm reading the right one. Okay. Music. Died on August 7th, 2015. I made a video with old pictures and music for the funeral. I picked Hallelujah in a cappella because they weren't really singing, but actually crying. When my children came into the room, I pretended I was writing. Instead, I looked at my mother's old photos, the fabric patterns on all her shirts, the way she held her hands together at the front of her body. In each picture, the small brown purse that now sits under my desk. At the funeral, my brother-in-law kept turning the music down. When he wasn't looking, I turned the music up because I wanted these people to feel what I felt. When I wasn't looking, he turned it down again. At the end of the day, someone took the monitor and speakers away, but the music was still there. This was my first understanding of grief. Yeah, I don't know, so small. This one's called My Mother's Teeth, and um, yeah, she had dentures, and for the longest time I thought she had one pair. And when she died, um, I discovered she had many pair, and they're all in this box in the garage. My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease, once again on August 3rd, 2015. The fake teeth sit in a box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them, thought I heard a whimper. I shoved the teeth into my mouth, but having two sets of teeth only made me hungrier. When my mother died, I saw myself in the mirror, her words in a ring around my mouth like powder from a donut. Her last words were in English. She asked for a Sprite. I wonder whether her last thought was in Chinese. I wonder what her last thought was. I used to think that a dead person's words die with them. Now I know that they scatter, looking for meaning to attach to, like a scent. My mother used to collect orange blossoms in a small, shallow bowl. I passed the tree each spring. I always knew that grief was something I could smell, but I didn't know that it's not actually a noun, but a verb, that it moves. And I will skip that one, and I'll read, um, maybe I'll read one more from here, and then I will switch. Yeah. This one's just called Grief. Mm -hmm. Grief, as I knew it, died many times. It died trying to reunite with other lesser deaths. Each morning, I lay out my children's clothing to cover their grief. The grief remains, but is changed by what it is covered with. A picture of oblivion is not the same as oblivion. My grief is not the same as my pain. My mother was a mathematician, so I tried to calculate my grief. My father was an engineer, so I tried to build a box around my grief, along with a small wooden bed that grief could lie down on. 
The text kept interrupting my grief, forcing me to speak about nothing. If you cut out a rectangle of a perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no wind, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky, that is grief. So I think I will switch now to um, da, da, da. <laughs> yeah, it's totally for a Zoom audience. So um, this is a book called Dear Memory, and so I um, I didn't want to write about my mother anymore. Actually, I didn't want to write about her at all, and um, and so when she died though I found so she hoarded things and um, I still have so many boxes that I haven't opened and I just kept on finding all these cool artifacts and items um, and it was so exciting at first um, birth certificates all sorts of things but that excitement just completely deflated uh, once I realized that these items only led to more questions and so uh, one day I just thought I'd ask my mother questions, and so I also started talking to my mother, and, and then it became my grandmother, and then it became um, childhood bullies, then it became my old teachers, and then um, it became an epistolary thing. So I'll just read the first one, and it's, you know, this is just the first three paragraphs, but it's, I'll read the whole thing. It's not that long, not much longer than that. Well, actually, that's not true. It's maybe four times longer than that, so you know. <laughs> It's called Dear Mother. I have so many questions. What city were you born in? What was your American birthday, your Chinese birthday? What did your mother do? What did your grandmother do? Who was your father, grandfather? It's too late now, but I would like to know. I would like to know why your mother followed Chiang Kai-shek, taking you and your six or seven siblings across China to Taiwan. I would like to know what was said in the planning meeting. I would like to know who was in that meeting, where that meeting took place. I would like to know the people who were left behind. I would like to know if there are other people who look like me. I would like to know if you took a train, if you walked, if you had pockets in your dress, if you wore pants, if your hand was in a fist, if you held a small stone. I would like to know if you thought the trees were black or green at night, if it was cold enough to see your breath to sting your fingers. I would like to know who you spoke to along the way, if you had some preserved salty plums, which we both love, in your pocket. I would like to know if you carried a bag, if you had a book in your bag. If, um, to like to know where you got your food for the trip. Why I never knew your mother, father, or your siblings, I would like to have known your father. I would like to know what his voice sounded like, if it was brittle or pale, if it was blue or red. I would like to know the sound he made when he swallowed food. I would like to know if your mother was afraid. During college, I spent several weeks with her in Taiwan. She bought me baozi buns every morning, the bao that steamed in small plastic bags with no ties, and sweet doujang, or tofu milk, always too hot for me to drink. She sat there and watched me eat, complained to me about your brother's wife, complained of being sick and how no one would help her. Do you know how long it took me to figure out how to call an ambulance? And then when they came, she refused to go. I still remember how the two men stared at me as if I could move a country. Listen, it's the wind. That's the same wind from your countries. Sometimes, if I listen closely at night, I can hear you drop a small bag at the door. I hear the sound of the bow touching the ground and the wind trying to open the bag. But when I open the door, there's nothing there. Just the same wind, thousands of years old. Happy birthday, wind. Happy birthday, mother. April 6, 1940. I know this now. All the nurses, doctors, and morticians asked me, so I memorized it. Your American birthday, April 6, 1940. I said again and again, as if I had known this my whole life. I too began to do collages, but I am not an artist like Lainey, so mine are a little more neophyte. Um, 
And I just put some photos on paper. <laughs> I didn't glue them on, and the paper, I cut, did a little, little cut little paper things, and then I wrote little poems. Um, this one I'll actually, yeah, maybe I'll read that one. And I'm the one in the white, and my sister is the one next to her, and the background is very sort of 1970s avocado green. I hear the phone ringing, but I can't answer it. It is silence calling. Uh, I'm not going to read those. And then I wrote, oh, maybe I'll read that one. Let's see what page it's on. It is, I'm so disorganized. It's on page 83. OK. And that, I think, is my great, great grandmother. <laughs> That's my mother above her. And I think those are her siblings, because they all kind of look alike. And I think they're missing a few, but I'm not sure. Once you had to stand behind your grandmother who left a country, each of your feet lifted off the land onto the boat like nightingales. I imagine the night sky, you below deck, light coming from two moons, but only half of your face lit up. You stood still as the moons rearranged themselves. During the switch, language was lost at sea. When language belongs to no one, a door opens. And then I did a whole bunch of other goofy things here, here. OK. So um, I will switch again. Let me check my time here. OK. Um, then I, the pandemic happened, obviously, and uh, it's still happening. And I, um, wanted to sort of try writing about nothing because so much of the stuff I had written before felt very subject matter heavy to me. And so I was like, how do I write about nothing? How is that even, can you write, can one write about nothing? Or can I write about nothing? I know many other people can, but I didn't know if I could. And so I decided to um, write in syllabics to try to get my own self out of the way, if that makes sense. And so these are all in various syllabic forms. Um, and I started writing tankas, you know, five, seven, five, seven, seven syllables in obit. And then I just started um, doing a little research, and there are a whole bunch of other forms with various fives and various sevens. And um, so I started writing those. And then I still felt like um, it would be fun to try harder to write about nothing. And so I used W.S. Merwin's titles, who, which are so flexible. And it was really fun to sort of you, to write that way. I'd never sort of written that way before. So I'll just read a few. They're tiny little miniature poems. And I put two on a page. Far along in the story. Once I sat in rain, opened my mouth to the sky. I yearned to be changed, but each drop was a small knife. At first, I fainted. But when I woke up, all the ticking had gone, and all the centuries were one. My choices no longer hurt. Nothing, right? Losing a language. We were born with a large door on our backs. When will we know if it opens? I'll read the small one on the bottom. Still morning. No mornings are still. The newly dead move the most. They force flowers to dilate. The string. Half of the tree is in my window, the same half I see each weekend, where addictions ebb and flow, where desire is a needle I shoot myself with. When the earth rotates, a person not tied down with longing falls off into space. Rain at night. To be the last drop of rain each night is sadness. It shuts the last door and jumps. I'll read the little one on the bottom called The Gods. The fact that leaves can't be put back on trees makes me think that you do not exist. And then I'll read one more. I don't know why this one's by itself. The lovers. There is a wildfire starving on top of a lake. See how the water holds fire but cannot end it? We insist on love, 
when all we want is mercy. And I will read a few new poems. I also wrote a few Marfa, Texas poems because I was in Marfa, Texas. Ha has anyone been to Marfa, Texas? No? No one. Yeah, one person. That's it? Um, Marfa, <laughs> it's beautiful. There, it's open. There's, uh, there, the Chinati Foundation is there. The Donald Judd Foundation is there. And you could see all kinds of neat artwork. And it's just a funky town. I encourage you to visit it if you can. But um, yeah, so I wrote a bunch of Marfa, Texas poems that are in the middle of that book that I won't read after all of that. <laughs> um, OK, so I will read a few new poems. And then that will be good, I think. So I f just finished um, a, a book of poems, and they are acrastic poems on Agnes Martin's artwork. I don't know if anyone knows Agnes, but um, they're in various uh, grids usually, but this one's in stripes. I'll show some of the, the t maybe the two I, actually maybe I'll read, we'll see. Okay, this one's called Untitled, number nine, 1995. Agnes only had nine years to live. The angels must have begun to hover around her canvas like monkeys. This canvas has nine white thin strips between the red and blue ones. I've spent my life thinking about the blue ones, thinking they were the future. But the future was red all along. I sense something is ending, but I'm not sure what. Maybe it's the future. This morning, I looked at a large spider web above my car. When I returned 10 minutes later, the weaver was gone, the web dismantled, but my hands were still open. Maybe a life doesn't matter so much as the feeling it leaves behind, whether anyone receives the feeling or not. Maybe our goal is to spend all the light since none of us asked to be born. That's it. They're gorgeous, 10 by 10. Um, I actually just went to the Rose Museum, is that what it's called? The Rose Art Museum at Brandeis today. And I stumbled upon an Agnes Martin 10 by 10 and it nearly um, blew my mind. It was so beautiful. Um, I'll read two more and then I will sit down. This one I don't have a, paint, like a picture of, but it's called Starlight 1962 and it's black, and so my poem it also is black. So I kind of messed around with form and things like that. Like the other one, you know, had the, the couplets to kind of match. Or did it have couplets? No, it did. I don't even know. I haven't read these enough. Um, Starlight, 1962. Suppose the stars are just our grief reflected back to us, proof that grief sometimes forgets its source, that it can find dead things no matter how distant. Everyone arrives one day and asks, is this it? And the stars answer back with more stars. I wonder if Agnes started at the bottom or at the top, if she went left to right or right to left. There's no use in wondering if the canvas was on the floor or on a table. To ask questions is to be distracted by point of view. Point of view has a terrible memory. I've looked at photos scrolling up and over, zooming in and out, and realize it is not love I want, just the ability to zoom back out. A woman loses herself when she can no longer zoom out. Agnes knew that love exists because of the distance of starlight, that desire is the only thing with nerve endings, that it drips, that it dries faster in the desert. She knew to paint it vertically, but to hang it horizontally. And this is my last one. One, I'll show it to you so you can have something beautiful to look at. Um, has anyone seen this one? It's in the MoMA in New York. Yeah, it's 10 by 10. It's so beautiful. Um, when I saw it, I just, I nearly died. But um, it's so, like little grids. And I think this is the only one she used with gold leaf. It's called Friendship 1963. I came to the city so I could see gold. When I arrived, though, the leaves were gold, too, and I became confused. I called the front desk four times, and Angel answered each time. By the third call, he ended with, talk soon. In the morning, a different man answered, and I burst into tears. On 53rd Street, small children kept on running into me. 
A father yelled so loudly at the boy on the scooter that I thought he knew I was carrying death on my back. By the time I arrived at the museum, there was a long line. The bald man in front of me kept turning around to look at me. I could tell by his forehead that he could hurt me. When I finally found the room, I was the only one in there. Everyone else was below me in the Picasso room. While I stared at the gold rectangles, two attendants talked about whether to work overtime and get paid time and a half. I wanted to tell them that there's no such thing as time, just time and a half. Sometime in the night, Ital Ednan had died. I had just seen her paintings the day before. The crowds were large, and I wondered whether our looking had accelerated her death. When I took a photo of Agnes's piece, I saw my dark reflection on the gold. I started counting the grids, but the bald man came up next to me. Suddenly, there were two dark shadows on the gold. I asked him to step away, but when he said no, it was Agnes's voice. Thank you. <laughs> 